Hi, just hello. It is Kathy here, Kathy Frey here again from IMCO, from the International Integrative Maternity Healthcare Organisation, and uh, welcome along to this week's Maternity Natural Health webinar. And uh, I'm very excited this week to have the wonderful Holly Lamar here to say hello. Ha wave hello, Holly. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for having me. Oh, it's so exciting. And um, Holly is is talking to us from Boise, Idaho. So we were just talking about the um, the the fires in Portland and Oregon. It's just oh, devastating. Yeah. Amongst everything else that the world is dealing with at the moment. Right. So right. look, welcome everybody. Um, I'm just letting people just sign on in here. And uh, please if you can go into the chat area at the bottom of your screen and let us know um, your role, your health professional role, or maybe you're a mum expecting, or maybe you're both. And also let us know where you're from. That would just be wonderful. And so what's going to happen today is that um, shortly I'm going to hand over the whole screen to Holly and she's got a lovely PowerPoint um, that she's going to go through with you. And uh, so that'll take around about half an hour or so. If you've got any questions during that time, please just type them into the um, Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Um, and we will absolutely make sure that those questions are answered. So um, after the presentation. And uh, yeah, so we've got some chats coming in now. That's awesome. It's always neat to see where everybody's coming from. And um, Oh, we've got, I can see we've got Winton Terry here. Well, he's an upcoming speaker. We'll, we'll be um, talking with him very soon on one of these. And uh, we've got people coming in from uh, Australia and uh, in America and New Zealand. And that is great. Oh, it's just wonderful. And thanks very much, particularly to the Australians, because it's kind of early in the morning for you guys. So that's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a, quite a lot today, particularly from um, Melbourne, so that's really neat. Um, okay, and I'm from MPLS. Is that Minneapolis? Would oh. that be right? MPLS? Holly, would that be right? Minneapolis? Well, I can't really see it, but probably, yeah, <laughs> Minneapolis, it's a, maybe. It's a short form, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Okay, oh, good to see some Queensland here as well. Fantastic. We just don't have Victoria coming in from Australia. <laughs> Look, it's just awesome to have you all here. And um, so so well done for taking the time. Oh, it is Minneapolis. Okay, yeah. it was a good guess <laughs> from the Kiwi. All <laughs> right. So, look, I'm going to hand over to you now, um, Holly. But uh, let me just remind everybody that um, Holly is an obstetric nurse and an educator and um, she works in that whole um, you know birth um, facilitate birthing families facilitating with that particular emphasis on the importance of sort of um, supporting uh, physiological birth um, and secure attachment and uh, we were just discussing in the green room before coming in how interesting it's going to be for these babies that have been born at the moment and uh, during COVID and, you know, with the isolation and the extra stress in the pregnancy and how on earth is this all going to impact, you know, in 20 years from now. Um, so uh, um, Holly's particular um, specialty, I guess, is that um, working to bridge that gap between the evidence and the practice, which is um, pretty much our passion here at IMCO as well, is so often there's you know some fascinating academic research that's known, but it doesn't actually get out into the um, coal face of the trenches for the mums themselves. And that, so just getting that information out there. So look, welcome so very much, Holly. Thank you for taking the time to be here and speak with us today. Um, and I'm, I'll hand it over to you and let you get your screen up. Okay, thanks. So let me get my screen share going on here. And just get my slideshow here from the beginning. Great, so you can all see my screen hopefully and I'll let um, Kathy kind of 
answer any questions along the way. Once again, my name's Holly Lammer. I know it's kind of hard to, uh, people have a little bit of trouble with my last name, but it's basically Lammer like hammer. <laughs> Um, and yeah, I've been in this um, field for about 22 years, um, got into it by, um, you know, a lot of the way a lot of women do, I think, is getting pregnant and having babies of my own and then just feeling this intense calling to be involved in, in birth work. And it's been in the last, um, I'd say, about 12 years that I've really uh, explored and um, delved into the practice of mindfulness and how it relates to prenatal psychology. And so I'm just gonna kind of kind of start with that. So, you know, talking about mindfulness specifically, but uh, bringing it back to wh why is it important? Um, and then for those of you, I mean, probably most of you have heard about pre and perinatal psychology. Um, the organization that I got a a certification as a prenatal psychology educator through is in in our country is called APA, the Association for Pre and Perinatal Psychology and Health, and basically it talks about that um, primal period, so from preconception all the way through that first year of life, and how the events that are occurring during that time frame um, have lifelong, you know, uh, physical, emotional spiritual health um, and well-being, how it has effects on our health moving down. And for those of you who aren't in America, I don't know, you know, one of the reasons I'm really passionate about that here is because uh, here in the United States, we have some of the highest reported levels of stress of any country, any developed country in the world, and actually many um, developing countries. So we live in an atmosphere of stress here in the United States. <laughs> Um, and so why is prenatal psychology important? But basically it's because that hormonal physiology of reproduction and nervous system preparation is basically preparing um, the offspring for what to expect when it comes out, which is really important. So, you know, if, we, if you live in a jungle with like poisonous, you know, snakes and, and predators and tigers, you know, you need to be able to react quickly to those um, stressors. The problem is when um, we create that environment of stress and then the baby comes out and there aren't those things to respond to and then that baby, that child moving forward is expected to behave in a certain way. And it's um, neuron, it's, it's, it's wiring, brain wiring isn't set up to be able to like, for, ex for example, sit in a classroom and pay attention to the teacher. So, um, Stress basically primes the offspring to expect predators. So whatever the stressor is, I mean, there's all different kinds of stressors, and this is just a very general overview, but, you know, that fight or flight response is what we're talking about when it comes to stress. They, generally speaking, either fight or flight or freeze, which is even worse. <laughs> um, and so we end up with... Um, you know, offspring that is hypervigilant, um, anxiety, um, ADHD kind of problems, um, violence, aggression. It, it translates differently depending on if it's a male or female, generally speaking. So um, what we really need to do is be paying attention to this concept of epigenetics. I'm not going to go into detail about epigenetics. This is just kind of a fun little slide to show, but basically the epigenetics portion of it, what we know is that it's really the womb environment that's the most important for proper development of brain function, immune function, mental, behavioral, and spiritual health. And that can be even more important than genetics because that's what is um, turning on that gene expression. So it's turning off or on certain expressions of the gene that it, when the fetus is being, you know, the offspring is being prepared in the womb, it's whatever um, hormonal input it's having from the gestator, <laughs> the person who's carrying the pregnancy, that those signals are turning on or off certain genes so that things will behave in a certain way when that child comes out. And I think that that's a pretty basic concept that most people know about. Um, like I said, my emphasis here um, in our country has been 
specifically because we have the highest levels of report, reported levels of stress. So that's the thing. It doesn't matter what the stressor is. If you report feeling stressed out, that is sending input to the growing baby. So um, just a little bit of history of kind of what's going on in there, which I'm sure you guys, are, most of you are familiar with. And I like to bring up this concept of, um, you know, how even in the early weeks, well, preconception, I'm not gonna go into preconception, but in those early weeks, you know, the fascia is being formed or fascia, however you wanna pronounce it. And um, what we know is that fascia is kind of like the first responder in a stress situation. So if from the very beginning of life, that little body is kind of like getting kind of tightly wound up because mom is stressed all the time and sending those stress hormones to the developing baby. I mean, that's a good thing if that baby needs to come out and live in a way where it's um, having to, you know, be hyper vigilant for looking out for predators. But if that little being is trying to be <laughs> primed for an environment of being able to sit quietly and respond appropriately in class and enjoy life and, and create meaningful relationships, that tightness from the very beginning can cause problems down the line. So that first trimester, skin, fascia, obviously pain channels, thermal sensors, um, I like this thing um, in that second trimester, really that there's a lot of other things going on and including emotional content, tone and, and emotional content. So now the sense of hearing is beginning to develop and you know, as, as you probably know, just the, the tone of mom's voice and how she's speaking and what she's responding to and even what she's hearing outside. So I always encourage people to, you know, when they're pregnant, you know, now's not the time to get really into like, you know, violent TV shows or <laughs> really uh, loud kind of grating kind of music. I mean, unless it's something you really, really enjoy because you want to be sending, you want, you want, you don't want to be reacting in a negative way when you're pregnant and sending that, those hormones to your, to your baby. Um, I love this um, little part about how when, when you don't see babies mouthing and licking and sucking and sucking their thumbs and doing that stuff in utero, you also know there might be a problem. So we want to be um, seeing a lot, not that we should be getting a lot of ultrasounds, but it's very, very normal. So increased touching of that lower part of the face and mouth and the fetus is, um, is probably an indicator of brain development. Um, including, and this is the important part, that being prepared for social interaction and self-soothing. Um, in that third trimester, uh, really those, that's when the attachment is forming. The, the, um, the brain, regions of the brain that are associated with um, uh, higher level functioning, emotional resilience, um, executive functioning, um, language, all of those kind of centers of the brain are starting to really kind of hone in in that third trimester. And so this is when those beginnings of the attachment style are actually forming. And I do have a podcast and I can give you some good listens, uh, things to send out people that I've interviewed child behavioral psychologists about how important it is, uh, mindfulness and pregnancy for the development of the baby's brain but all of this is being formed by, of course, the mom's emotional states. And so, so far, because <laughs> we were just talking about stress during the pandemic, right? But any, any time, um, it's kind of paints a picture of gloom and doom. There's a lot of stress in our world. There's a lot of um, discord. There's a lot of violence. There's a lot of uh, wars going on right now. Climate change. There's a lot to be worried about, I guess. Um, and what we know, and this is kind of like, I'm kind of starting out with the doom and gloom and then we're gonna change it to like, what can we do better? And that's when mindfulness comes in. What we know about, you know, like even from pre, preconception, you know, unwanted babies have low birth weight, more premature, small for gestational age, 
all of these kind of issues, including increased criminal activity, and even moms that are ambivalent about their pregnancies. Um, those babies have a little bit more problems. Moms have a little bit more trouble breastfeeding. Um, they're a little bit um, more awkward and not confident handling their babies. Whereas when we have an intentional period of prenatal bonding, so we're really working on uh, forming that attachment and sending the hormones that support attachment, um, the immediate benefits of that prenatal bonding practice, um, and these are some, from some studies, I can send those resources out if you want easier, less traumatic births, fewer interventions, more success breastfeeding, the babies are calmer, there's fewer cesareans, fewer preterm deliveries, and less postpartum depression in any perinatal mood disorder, actually. Um, of course, lifetime of ben benefits for that baby, there's more secure attachment, better relationships, there's less substance abuse, more empathy. Um, they report feeling happier. <laughs> and that's kind of like the bottom line, right? Doesn't matter what your life situation is, if you report feeling happy, then that's a good thing. Um, better emotional regulation. And I also like to bring this up, and I guess, you know, it depends on where you're living, but here in our um, community, Boise, Idaho, uh, Idaho specifically, we have a lot of surrogacies and gestational carriers. And um, this, it's really important to remember that the attachment and the bonding um, that's happening in utero is, is dependent on the womb uh, mother, <laughs> not on the biological parents. That baby doesn't know any difference, you know, that, that, it's, that this person is not their mommy. So really important that we facilitate prenatal bonding with those babies as well. I also teach classes for um, adoptive parents and um, moms who are planning on um, placing their babies for adoption. So um, the bottom line is all of these early experiences really are um, setting the foundation for a lifetime of um, emotional and physical health and well-being. So what, you know, what can we do about it? Um, and what, this is where my, where, where I kind of like started, I was teaching a regular childbirth class in the hospital and I was, you know, seeing a lot, a lot of uh, people have babies. I mean, probably attended over 4,000 births and just noticing like what, what made that person have a positive experience? So, you know, we have a lot of birth trauma. Um, I don't know how it is in the other countries that uh, people that I'm talking to, but in our country, we have a lot of what people call birth trauma or traumatic birth experience, post-traumatic stress from birth, our, their birth experience. Um, and, and, you know, there's a lot of reasons for that. <laughs> I would say most of it is the medicalization of birth, but the, we also have to deal with the facts. And you know, in this country, 90 to 95% of people give birth in a hospital. So how can we make that experience better for them? And when I started practicing and teaching yoga and mindfulness, I really noticed a, a difference in me. So since I'm like kind of a science geeky nerd, I started to look up all the information about what, you know, what's really happening happening when you practice mindfulness. And so that's why I developed this mindfulness-based birth education program. And, and the reason I emphasize mindfulness, because it's kind of like the foundation of existence, of anybody's existence of being, um, you know, ha happy and joyful and um, less trauma. And it's simple and easy to do. You don't have to pay a lot of money. <laughs> you can do it all the time every day. So for me, it was a fairly simple way to kind of get um, access. There's not any fancy breathing techniques. You know, it's just very, very basic um, practice. So I just like to, you know, talk about what is mindfulness because some people don't really understand what it is. And it's basically just a mental state that's achieved by focusing your awareness on the present moment. And I always bring this up to my moms, of course, that, that I'm teaching while calmly accepting one's feelings, thoughts, and bodily sensations. So 
things might come up into labor in labor <laughs> that are in t and that you might need to accept right the basic human ability to be fully present aware of where we are and what we're doing and not overly reactive or overwhelmed by what's going on around us so it's basically present moment awareness and when I bring this up in my classes, it's funny because a lot of people are like, oh, I don't have any experience with mindfulness. Oh, I've never practiced anything. I never, I've never meditated. It is commonly associated with meditation, of course. Um, but, you know, anybody who's, you know, learned how to ride a bicycle or learned how to drive a car or, you know, a lot of dads come in and they have no experience or they say they have no experience and I'm like, Around here, we do a lot of outdoorsy activities. And I'm like, oh, uh, do you, have you ever hunted or fished? Oh yeah, I go fly fishing all the time. I imagine you're probably being pretty mindful when you're fly fishing <laughs> or when you're hunting or, you know, I kind of bring those kind of things up. So, you know, this is, this is what I love about mind, about, you know, being able to kind of bring, bridge that gap, I guess, between, you know, evidence and practice and, bridge the gap between, you know, what people call like the woo woo stuff, which by the way, that's kind of who I am and what I do. I teach yoga as well. Um, but the, the science shows that mindfulness literally changes the brain. So that's why it's important, right? You have increased activity in the parts of the brain that are responsible for positive emotions and emotional regulation. Um, it shifts the brain from sympathetic to parasympathetic responses, which in turn shifts the body responses. I mean, there's a lot of ways you can achieve this. Mindfulness is just my kind of tack on it. There's actually increased brain wave frequencies that are responsible for attention and focus. So when I bring this up too, especially in our community, we have a lot of problems with focus and attention in our children. We have the highest rates of ADHD and different kinds of autism, autism spectrum disorder of almost any developed country in the world. <clears throat> so, um, so this is the good news, right? We can actually rewire our babies' brains while they're growing in our bellies <laughs> um, towards emotional regulation. So just like you can wire your baby's brain towards stress, hyperreactivity, overreaction, aggression, you can also wire your baby's brain to go the other way. And of course, there's also intergenerational trauma that is part of this. And that can take a long time to reverse. Um, but even that's why it's even more important to start now. So there's so many different ways that people can kind of approach public health and um, community health. And my approach has just been, let's start before the baby's even born. <laughs> because if we can start there and really plant those seeds and really get something going, um, you know, it has the possibility to really change the trajectory throughout that, he, that um, baby's life. So what we know is that the hormones that the birther is secreting is passed, are passed through the placenta and they have the same effect on the baby's system. So what we know about stress, obviously, is that um, when, the birth, when the pregnant person or the person who's giving birth is stressed, the blood is shunted away from the uterus. And when that birther is relaxed, there's lots of um, blood flow to the growing baby. And, and, you know, hopefully that baby's being prepped to come out and, like I said, in, enjoy their life, you know, have peace have connection, feel confident in themselves. So when mom practices mindfulness, those effects are going straight to the baby. Um, and I'm going to do a little practice with you guys, just a really short little practice to just kind of let you know how simple it is to practice mindfulness. But I just wanted to point, besides these other things about prenatal bonding, there are certain studies, specific studies, that have showed that um, mindfulness-based childbirth preparation um, help moms connect to their innate ability to give birth. Um, they have a better birth experience. They have stronger relationships. 
um, those hormonal benefits pass to the baby. There's fewer unnecessary interventions. And I like this one, increased birth self-efficacy. And that's that notion of, I can do this, right? My body knows how to do this. I feel confident. Um, like I said, decreased perinatal mood disorders. Their babies are happier and there's better um, breastfeeding attachment and bonding. So um, this is the thing though, how, how do you do it, right? <laughs> it seems so simple. And wh what I like to point out is that we have a lot of different kinds of childbirth classes, right? Available, I don't know wherever you guys are from. They're kind of the normal hospital-based childbirth class. In, cath in, in fact, there have been studies that come out that show that a normal kind of, um, the kind of uh, childbirth class that's usually offered through the hospital increases fear of birth. <laughs> um, so we need to change the way that we're educating people for one thing. And it's okay, okay, but it's how you respond to that fear. But it increases fear of birth and increases interventions. That's, I mean, basically what, what the studies show about um, hospital, regular hospital-based birth practices. Um, but when, when you're practicing mindfulness or when you're encouraging people to practice mindfulness, I just like to, you know, kind of just take it down to like the ABCs. <laughs> Some people call it stop, breathe, think. I like to say ABC just because it's kind of something that I've, I've come up with, right? But you just become aware of the present moment by becoming aware of your body. So anybody who's listening, just for a moment, maybe just close your eyes and become aware of your body. I mean, super simple. How are you sitting? What parts of your body are touching the chair? And you don't have to change anything. Um, do your shoulders seem relaxed? And you know, you usually just by saying, do your shoulders seem relaxed? Like even me, I'm like, oh, I'm gonna relax my shoulders. I didn't even consciously choose to do that. It's just brought awareness to my shoulders, allowed my shoulders to relax. So when you stop and pay attention to your body, you come out of your thinking mind and out of any kind of hindbrain response and you, it stops that automatic reaction. So once you become aware of your body in space, you know, are your hands relaxed, are your feet relaxed? You know, overall, how does my body feel? So this is like the first establishment of mindfulness, is mindfulness of the body. And then you notice your breathing. So usually we're kind of on this a little bit more, uh, increased breath rate, maybe a little shallow. But once we begin to notice the breathing, you, you don't have to change anything, but you might just notice the inhale and the exhale and how it might feel different. You might notice um, that your breath is becoming a little slower as you pay more attention to it. And then you might like intentionally decide to deepen the breath and make it slower. And oftentimes when I get to, if I'm really spiraling out of control, I won't even notice my inhale, I'll just say exhale to myself when I'm exhaling. So breathe in and then say to yourself, exhaling as you're exhaling, because it's the exhale that really drops us out of that sympathetic nervous system response. And literally if you, take three to five full deep belly breaths, your um, nervous system shifts from sympathetic to parasympathetic response. And then you can kind of choose of how you wanna respond instead of just the reaction of what might've happened before taking that moment to think about it. So that's kind of that conscious choice. And um, when we, practice this in our everyday life, um, it, the wiring changes. And, but it does take practice. That's, that is the problem, especially if we are of the sort that has not practiced this. We generally are multitaskers, <laughs> which by the way, the brain doesn't actually multitask. The brain is really only able to pay attention to one thing at a time and it just keeps hopping back and forth and then it gets fatigued and you have brain fog and all kinds of stress. So. How do you practice is just ABCs, awareness to the body, awareness to the breath, and then 
oh, what do I want to do about this? What do I want to what do I want to do about the fact that, you know, my shoulders are are really tense? What do I want to do about the fact that this person in front of me is driving 10 miles an hour under the speed limit and I'm on my way to work and I'm late? You know, so we can instead of just yelling, <laughs> cursing, we can uh, decide how we want to react instead of our unconscious reaction just taking over. So it's basically responding versus reacting. And then what I have, and this is just for you guys, and you know, if you do have um, moms that you're working with, families that you're working with, this is great practice for children. Um, I always say do a simple sit there and do the ABCs of mindfulness if you can for five minutes a day. No, you know, you don't have to clear your mind of thoughts. You can't clear your mind of thoughts. Our minds are made of thoughts. If you had no thoughts, I would be very concerned. <laughs> so you want to just notice the thoughts, notice the body, notice the breath, notice the thoughts, bring it back to the body, bring it back to the breath. So you're just kind of doing the cycling of noticing your body, noticing your breath, and then all of a sudden you realize, oh, I'm thinking about the grocery list. Okay, bring it back to the body, bring it back to the breath. That moment that you notice that your attention has strayed, that's where the, the, the heart of the practice comes. That's where the benefit comes, is every time you notice that your attention has strayed, you bring it back to your body and to your breath. And then um, I also, this is called, I call this gratitude practice where you're really spending at least five minutes a day noticing what gives you joy and let, let your senses lead you. So instead of maybe thinking about some really fantastic experience you've had, it's, or like a person, or, I mean, you can think of that, but it's really simple, you know, because maybe everything's shit in your life. I'm sorry if I said shit on the international thing. Um, <laughs> and you don't have anything that you can really feel joyful about. Um, you know, maybe the color of a flower or the smell of your favorite candle or the feeling of sunshine on your skin, the warmth of the coffee mug or the tea mug in your hand. And so you take full deep, three full deep breaths using your senses like, oh, this feels nice and warm. Oh, I love this color, the blue sky, whatever it is. And you take three deep breaths into that to really kind of cement that feeling of joy into your cells. And then also working with discomfort. Anytime you feel uncomfortable, either like in your body or in your mind, there's anxiety, there's a lot to be anxious about. Um, you know, take full deep, take three full deep breaths. If you feel like my example is going, you know, behind somebody who's going under the speed limit when I'm in a hurry. Um, not that I speed around, but like, <laughs> that's one thing that I know just drives me nuts, you know? So I'm like, okay, I feel the steering wheel in my hand. I'm going to take three full deep breaths and that will shift your nervous system and you'll be able to respond instead of react to the, the discomfort. <clears throat> and then just kind of in conclusion, you know, how is mindfulness or how can mindfulness benefit um, in pregnancy, whoops, I just went right on there, decreases the effects of stressors, which and helps with prenatal bonding, attachment, primes the baby system for peace, um, helps with everyday aches and pains. During birth, obviously, working with discomfort during pregnancy is going to help you suffer less from pain. If there's complications, you're more able to stay calm. So the reports that I get from the people who take my mindfulness class are not necessarily oh, everything went exactly the way I wanted it. It was like, you know, everything may have gone to hell in a handbasket, but I felt good about the experience and I felt calm during the chaos. So that's, that's the benefit of the birth. So then you walk away from the birth with um, a transformational experience instead of a traumatic experience. And then of course, in postpartum, there's better attachment bonding breastfeeding, no matter what happens. Um, better able to deal with the complications of hormone fluctuations. Um, uh, mindfulness increases immune function, which is going to help with healing and recovery. And then for parenting, of course, like the birth is nothing, right? <laughs> this is where the actual benefit of the practice comes. 
is for your parenting journey. So parents who practice mindfulness have better experience with their children, better relationships with each other. Children have better emotional regulation, self-confidence, and fewer behavioral problems when their parents practice mindfulness. So that's kind of basically a really quick um, uh, <laughs> background or like, a, I don't know, presentation on why it's important, how simple it is, and um, I'm ready to take any questions. Or do you want me to stop sharing now, Kathy? Um, yes, that would be fine. Uh, well, maybe just leave that, la that um, last slide up there for a moment. Although, um, just everybody that's watching this live will be receiving an email tomorrow um, with Holly's details as well. So if you're watching this live, don't feel like you need to jot that all down. But if you're watching this later, then you certainly might want to make a note of those contacts and information. Um, I love that um, last bit that you talked about, that the um, children of parents who practice mindfulness have the, the benefit. I think that's just gorgeous. Um, and because we kind of know that in our, in our soul, but, right. yeah. <laughs> but the fact that, you know, research is showing that is, um, is so interesting. So feel free, anybody, um, to send through any questions or queries that you've got for Holly. Um, I think that, um, look, it's just so interesting. Um, we've listening to you today. We've certainly had um, more, uh, quite a bit on this type of topic, and um, it's just wonderful that it is topical. You know, particularly uh, during a, a pandemic. You right. Know, it's how, how, this idea that women need that little bit of guidance of ideas of, of to cope with the stress is right. so incredibly relevant. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And we were talking before that, you know, probably not since World War II have women pregnant, ex our clients, expectant women, expectant mothers to be, been worried about the fact that they're pregnant during this time. Right. Um, you know, and certainly when it was World War Two, World War One, women were probably the Western women would have been feeling very similar um, during that time. And um, so uh, it's neat to get these like really simple, practical ideas of even just saying, "Hey, take three to five deep belly breaths." You know, yeah. um, that's a really doable thing, right? Right. Um, right. And women appreciating that they are impacting you know turning on or turning off particular genes within their baby they you know that's the fact that they can do make that difference for them um, right so is there anything that we um that you haven't uh anything that you'd like to add i know you've gone through the um the actual powerpoint but is there any any other points that you'd like to sort of cover off that I guess maybe I, particularly relating to this time in the world at the moment. Right. There's a couple of things I'd like to say. First of all, um, uh, I think it's really important, and this is what I also teach because we are a lot, we are stressed out. And on my, I do a lot of just simple daily meditations for for moms, especially during this time. Um, it's especially important to not beat yourself up. So for you know. Um, it's, if you know, if you're pregnant and you know that you've been stressed out, that's like the worry, right? It's like, whenever I teach this class, I get people that are like, you know, already six months pregnant. They're like, oh my God, I've ruined my baby because I've been so stressed out. So <laughs> it's no, no, it's like when you feel that you, you talk to your baby. So that's the other thing, like the, the, the changes that are happening in the brain when you just talk to your baby, it's like, oh, I'm really having a stressful day today you know, because I'm really worried about whatever. And, you know, I can't, you know, have my doula at my birth because they're not letting them in the hospital. I don't know what they're going on in other parts of the world. And I mean, even in our own country, it depends on where you're giving birth. Um, I can't have my support person with me, you know, like talk to your baby like your baby is a real person. And just the fact, I mean, it doesn't really matter the words that you're saying, but like the fact that you have the awareness to like, oh, you know, hey, this doesn't have anything to do with you, baby. 
this doesn't have anything to do with you. This is mom stress and it doesn't have anything to do with you. And so even though, you know, maybe the baby doesn't understand exactly what you're saying, first of all, I think they might, um, <laughs> they, that you've shifted your nervous system by just having the awareness to talk to them. So we need to also be really careful that we don't stress people out more that are already stressed by telling them, oh, you shouldn't be stressed, right? <laughs> so, oh, so hear you on that one. Actually, yeah. I'll, I'll give you to um, unshare now on the screen. That'd be great. Okay. Um, but no, you're so right. You know, the, the last thing we need to do is, is slather some more mummy guilt. Right, <laughs> right. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, we're so... We just do that anyway. We, we blame right. everything on ourselves. And yeah. um, because we care for our babies. So right. the fact that you can say that, uh, that okay, I am, is to like communicate and talk to the baby and say, honey, I am stressed, but it's not your fault. And I'm right. not screwing at you. Um, yeah. And just saying that out loud, um, I know that with my own uh, second pregnancy, I had an incredibly stressful pregnancy because of conditions that were outside of my control. Mm -hmm. And um, at that stage, I wasn't a midwife. Um, I wasn't an author. I didn't really know squat about squat. And I wish that I had known that at the time that I could have, I knew it wasn't my baby's fault. I knew I wasn't annoyed at my baby, but I know that I was um, incredibly stressed. And in mm -hmm. fact, um, when uh, that particular baby decided to self-wean and became disinterested in the breast at about sort of eight or nine months, um, she wished, her behavior just went like seriously loopy. And I ended up taking her to a homeopath and we treated her for adrenaline withdrawal. I mean, oh, wow. Her. Yeah. And it worked a treat. Like, I, she was back to normal. Um, and interestingly, you know, well, she's 21 now, but she is an adrenaline junkie. So, yeah. and she's training to be a paramedic. So, there we go. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> and, and um, but that I was always a very conscious of the fact that she, her pregnancy was in the middle of a lot of very stressful things in my life that were nothing to do with her. Right. Um, you know, and uh, I, I don't think I ever sat there and said, this is not your fault. I just carried the guilt. Right, yeah. And just saying that to our mums, especially during COVID. Right. Um, it's not your fault. And, right. And um, tell your baby it's not. I think that's so empowering. Right. And then also, I w and during, especially during this time, you know, we can't have our support people just, just remembering that, like, you know, you, you, there's a lot of generations of women who have given birth, <laughs> no matter where you live, in times of stress, and they've, pan they've passed down that wisdom to you. So you have it. You have it in, in there. You have it in your soul. You have it in your cells. And you can get through this. And your baby's really smart. Your baby also knows how to be born. <laughs> yeah. So give it's our right. baby. And I mean, yeah. um, it's it, it, Margaret has made a comment here that stress is a necessary part of life, and it's absolutely true. But I think exactly there are certainly times when you just know that you're more stressful than you'd like to have been in that pregnancy. Um, right that particular pregnancy for me, I also got chicken pox at 20 weeks. Oh, um, wow. So, yeah, let's just add a bit more on there. And I'm like, yeah. I didn't yeah. even know I'd never had chicken pox. And oh, I got that from my elder child, and I was incredibly sick. And the placenta was mush at the end of that pregnancy. Um, wow. Yeah, like there was a lot going on. And yeah. um, so we do know that stress is a normal part. Of, of life but it's that when you know that you're in the abnormally high level of stress um and that you can't eliminate so just being able to tell our woman to say i know i'm stressed i think that's beautiful <laughs> beautiful yeah, i think it's that's one of the most important things we need to take away and and i love how i think it was Win winton terry said being stressed but then learning to let go 
not only gives the baby the problem, but also gives them the answer. So yeah, you're basically priming right. your baby's nervous system for like, ooh, there was a stressful moment and oh, I can take a deep breath and now it's gone. So yes. it's not just like lingering in there and you know, um, wreaking havoc basically. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, absolutely. And how to manage that stress, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Rather yeah. than stressing about stress. <laughs> right, yeah, stressing about stress is not helping. No. No, and I do that, so I speak from personal experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so. Well, um, if anybody's got any last questions, just um, send them on through. Otherwise, we'll um, we're almost out of time here. Yeah. Um, but I do have a I do have a training coming up next month too. It's all going to be online. So fabulous. Tell us about that. that, and maybe because this is going to be on YouTube um, more permanently, tell us about the, the, the training that's coming up next month and perhaps ongoingly how that works. Um, yeah, so on, um, on the training will be on online and in private diet. We'll have a few people in person. It's October 24th and 25th and it's for um, uh, CEs for any birth worker. And um, it and then I'll have everything will be recorded so you'll have like a couple of weeks afterwards to access the stuff and then um, uh, you would sign up through my website www.embryoga.com go to book online to the training sessions and then that's how I generate the the email list for the zoom links yeah and it's just basically Thank talking you. about how all the stuff I just talked about prenatal psychology it's two days so you get a lot more expansion on on the topics <laughs> yeah brilliant brilliant well thank you so much holly and uh thank you everybody for um coming in today and i'm just having a look at some of these other comments how do you disseminate this info to mums Katie's asking, so that they don't feel like they're doing wrong or damaging their baby if they are stressed and anxious or depressed. Well, I think maybe um, you might feel that we've sort of covered that one off is, is to, you know, I, I mean, I've certainly um, seen clients over the years who are in those situations where they've got stresses beyond their control in their pregnancy. Right. You know, maybe their mother-in-law is dying or the, their partner's yeah. lost their job or, um, yeah, so that's great. Thanks, Katie. So I do feel yeah. like we've covered that. That's really good. Um, yeah, thanks, Winton. Yeah, so good. Being stressed, but then learning to let go. Not only right. gives the baby the problem, but also gives them the answer. That's a beautiful, beautiful comment that you've um, got there. Um, yeah, so look, thank you, everybody. I think that's all. And anything that you would like to wind up on there, Holly? No, that's just it. I really thank everybody for listening. And I just feel like um, the more that we can water those seeds of peace for the next generation, the better our world will be. And um, of course, you know, for ourselves. <laughs> um, but um, I really appreciate you and appreciate all that you're doing. And thanks for having me on. Oh, thanks for taking the time to join us. We've had just the most um, fantastic response um from you know experts like yourself that are specializing in certain areas wanting to share that information and you know i think it's just so amazingly exciting that you know we, we even have these this technology these days where we can you know chat online like this and share it i mean it's just so brilliant you know yeah um and so so that's just neat and, and we but we couldn't do it without our attendees attending so exactly thank you, very much, thank you everybody for tuning in today and uh, we wish you all a wonderful rest of your week and uh hope to see you same day same same time perhaps next week with our next speaker thank you everybody and thank you holly you're welcome see you